Britain's genetic history is brutal. Whole populations arrive, dominate for a few centuries, then disappear from the DNA record almost entirely. That happened after farming reached Britain around 4000 BC. It happened again during the Bell Beaker period around 2400 BC, when large parts of Britain saw up to three quarters of their ancestry replaced in just a few hundred years. Yet one place keeps breaking that pattern. In Wales, ancient genetic layers that vanished across much of Britain are still detectable today. Not as folklore, as statistics. Even more unsettling, modern genetic studies don't show Wales as one group at all. They split it north and south, with differences comparable to those seen between entirely separate regions of Britain. That should not have survived. Not after the most violent population turnover in British prehistory. Not after Roman occupation. Not after centuries of pressure from Anglo-Saxon England. But large genome-wide studies, including a 2018 Nature paper on ancient British DNA, show that Wales absorbed these shocks differently. Where England was repeatedly overwritten, Wales behaved more like layered sediment. New ancestry settled on top, but older layers were never fully erased. This is not a story about being untouched. It's about why, in one corner of Britain, history never managed a clean reset. You're watching Stone and Bone. If you want evidence-driven stories where DNA and archaeology expose what history smooths over, subscribe now. Around 11,000 years ago, as the last ice age loosened its grip, small groups of hunter-gatherers moved into Western Britain. What matters is not just that they arrived early, but where they stayed. Much of what is now Wales was hard to cross, even in prehistory. Steep valleys, dense woodland, and limited open plains meant fewer travel corridors and fewer outsiders passing through. Think of it like slow-moving water versus a fast river. In open lowlands, people flow in and out easily. In rugged terrain, movement bottlenecks. Genetically, that difference compounds over centuries. While later migrations across Europe often swept away these early hunter-gatherer lineages, Wales retained more of them than most regions of Britain. A 2016 genome-wide analysis of ancient Britons showed that Western Britain preserved higher traces of Mesolithic ancestry long after it faded elsewhere. This is the first pattern that repeats again and again. Wales does not reject newcomers, it simply mixes with them more slowly. By the time farming arrived, Wales already carried a deeper genetic memory than much of Britain. Farming reached Britain around 4000 BC, carried by Neolithic groups whose ancestry ultimately traced back to Anatolia. In southern and eastern Britain, this was a turning point. Population size increased, diets shifted, and genetically, many earlier hunter-gatherer lines were diluted rapidly. Wales experienced the same transition, but at a different pace. The landscape limited how fast farming could spread. Narrow valleys and poorer soils meant smaller farming communities and longer coexistence with local foragers. Instead of a clean handover, the two groups overlapped for generations. Genetically, that matters. Studies published in Nature Ecology and Evolution in 2019 showed that while Neolithic farmer ancestry became dominant across Britain, its impact was weaker in Western regions, including Wales. Older ancestry was not erased, it was folded in. This helps explain why Wales begins to diverge early from the genetic trajectory seen in much of England. Change arrived, but it arrived diluted. If geography sets the speed of change, Wales was already moving slower than the rest of Britain. Around 2400 BC, Britain experienced its most dramatic population shift. Groups associated with the Bell Beaker culture spread rapidly bringing new burial practices, metalworking, and ancestry linked to steppe populations from Eastern Europe. In much of Britain, this wasn't gradual blending. It was a reset. A landmark 2018 genome-wide study published in Nature showed that in some regions, more than 70% of ancestry shifted within a few centuries. Male lineages changed even faster, suggesting that power, status, and migration were tightly linked. Wales did not escape this event. Beaker-associated ancestry became a major component of Welsh DNA, but the replacement was incomplete. Older genetic layers survived in higher proportions than in many parts of England. A useful way to picture this is renovation versus demolition. In much of Britain, the old structure was torn down. In Wales, new floors were added, but the foundation stayed. This moment matters because it sets the upper limit. 
If whales could retain older ancestry through the most disruptive migration in British prehistory, later invasions would face the same resistance. And they did. By around 1000 BC, Britain entered what we now call the Celtic world. But this is where popular explanations oversimplify the story. The Celts were not a single population sweeping in and replacing everyone else. They were interconnected societies sharing languages, art styles, and social systems. Celtic identity spread more like an operating system than a population replacement. In Wales, this distinction matters. Certain genetic markers often associated with Celtic ancestry, especially common male lineages, are widespread. But their prominence does not mean they arrived with a single Celtic invasion. Many expanded locally over centuries, amplified by inheritance patterns and limited outside mixing. In other words, Celtic culture layered itself onto an existing population rather than wiping it clean. That's why Wales can appear strongly Celtic culturally while still preserving genetic signals far older than the Iron Age. It's not a contradiction. It's continuity wearing new clothes. When Roman forces pushed into Western Britain around AD 48, they brought roads, forts, and military control. What they did not bring in large numbers was settlers. Roman Wales functioned mainly as a frontier zone. Garrisons were stationed, taxes collected, and local elites co-opted. From a genetic point of view, that distinction is critical. Soldiers rotate. Administrators leave. Families change populations. Most did not. A large ancient DNA study published in 2024 examining Roman-era burials across Britain found surprisingly limited evidence for long-distance migration in many Western regions. Political control was visible. Genetic replacement was not. The same pattern repeats a few centuries later. Anglo-Saxon migrations transformed much of Eastern and Southern Britain, contributing up to roughly 40% of ancestry in some English regions. In Wales, that influence drops sharply as you move west from the border. Think of it like dye dropped into water. In the lowlands, it spreads fast and far. In the hills, it diffuses, then fades. Power changed hands. DNA mostly stayed put. If conquest alone doesn't guarantee genetic change, what actually does? Vikings did reach Wales. Archaeology and genetics both confirm it, but their presence followed a familiar pattern. Along certain coastal areas, especially near natural harbors, Norse ancestry appears at low levels, often estimated at just a few percent. Inland, it largely disappears. Unlike parts of Ireland or Northern England, Wales never became a major Viking settlement zone. Recent genetic work has added another twist. Evidence now suggests that small amounts of Scandinavian ancestry may have reached Britain even before the classic Viking Age, likely through trade and earlier contacts. But again, the signal weakens rapidly away from the coast. The Norman conquest of 1066 tells a similar story. Norman power reshaped castles, laws, and landholding systems. Genetically, its impact in Wales remained limited. Norman rule relied on elites and fortifications, not mass migration. Stone structures change skylines. Populations change only when families move and stay. In Wales, they mostly didn't. Up to this point, the story has been about Wales resisting outside change. But the biggest surprise comes when you look inside Wales itself. Fine-scale genetic studies, including the People of the British Isles Project, show that Wales does not form a single genetic group. It splits internally, most clearly between North and South. The differences are strong enough to rival those between entirely separate regions of Britain. What makes this remarkable is how old the pattern appears to be. These genetic divisions line up closely with medieval kingdoms that vanished centuries ago. The political borders faded. The biological ones did not. This tells us something basic about everyday life. People married locally. They moved short distances. Valleys and uplands mattered more than royal decrees. Over hundreds of years, those habits quietly etched boundaries into the DNA. So, when someone says Welsh DNA, they're collapsing multiple histories into one phrase. In reality, Wales preserves several overlapping pasts, still detectable today. And that leads to a deeper question worth sitting with. If DNA can remember borders history forgot, what else might it be quietly preserving?
By this point, it's clear that geography slowed change, but culture helped lock it in. The survival of the Welsh language was not just symbolic. Language shapes who people marry, trade with, and trust. For centuries, Welsh-speaking communities were more likely to remain socially and economically connected to each other than to English-speaking neighbors. Over time, that pattern leaves a genetic imprint. Surnames add another quiet layer of continuity. Wales adopted fixed surnames later than much of Europe, largely between the 15th and 16th centuries. Before that, a patronymic system dominated. Names changed each generation, keeping identity tied to family lines rather than rigid labels. When surnames finally stabilized, many were drawn from local places, personal traits, or common given names. That means Welsh surnames often reflect older settlement patterns instead of later migrations. In practical terms, names and language acted like a slow filter. Movement happened, but it happened locally. Genetics doesn't respond to laws or declarations. It responds to daily life, who you meet, who you marry, where you stay. This is where the story needs precision. Welsh genetics is not about being untouched by history. Wales absorbed farmers, beaker groups, Celtic culture, Roman rule, Anglo-Saxon pressure, Viking contact, and Norman control. All of it left traces. What makes Wales stand out is not isolation, but selective survival. Change arrived repeatedly, but it arrived unevenly. Geography slowed it, culture shaped it, time layered it. Instead of clean breaks, the genetic record shows accumulation. New ancestry settled on top of older layers, rather than erasing them. That's why Wales often appears distinct in large genetic studies. Not because it stood still, but because it changed more carefully than the rest of Britain, while the pace elsewhere accelerated. Wales functions less like a reset point and more like an archive. Older signals remain readable because they were never fully overwritten. The genetic history of Wales isn't a romantic legend and it isn't a claim of purity. It's something more grounded and more human. It's the record of communities that absorbed change without disappearing, of families who stayed rooted while borders shifted above them, of history preserved not in chronicles, but in the quiet math of inheritance. DNA doesn't remember empires. It remembers movement, marriage, and time. And in Wales, it remembers a past that much of Britain no longer carries, as clearly. You're watching Stone and Bone, where DNA and archaeology strip history down to its deepest layers. If this is the kind of evidence-driven storytelling you value, subscribe now. There's still far more buried beneath the surface.